You said that 15 times more glyphosate is being used compared to before GMOs were introduced. Why is that happening and what impact does that have on people? There are two reasons why there's more glyphosate. Monsanto actually started genetically engineering crops in order to maintain a stranglehold on the sales of glyphosate-based herbicides, which was Roundup, because their patent for glyphosate was expiring in 2000. So they created Roundup-ready crops engineered to be sprayed with Roundup. And when the farmers bought the seeds, they signed a contract that they had to buy Monsanto's version of their glyphosate-based herbicide or one of their licensees. So they maintained a hold on much of the market. And now the farmers are spraying Roundup over the tops of the entire field. Most of the soy, over 90% of the soy and the corn and the canola and the cotton are genetically engineered. And most of that is Roundup ready, meaning that it's sprayed. So the Roundup is now increased because of the acreage of the Roundup ready crops and the ability to, for the farmers to spray over the entire field, not just a spot spray. And that has increased the overall exposure of the Roundup and its chief poison glyphosate in the environment. And so now the weeds have outsmarted Monsanto and developed resistance. And so that means that the farmers are using more and more concentrated versions of Roundup with higher levels of glyphosate. And so between those two, that, that's substantial. Adding to that, about 15 years ago, Monsanto started to advertise that farmers could spray Roundup on crops just before harvest to cause quick ripening of grains and to dry down the grains and kill off all the weeds in preparation for next year. Same with the beans. And so now they're using it as a desiccant to dry down the crops three to five days before harvest, which again, more glyphosate, more Roundup. And so now all those reasons have resulted in a massive use of glyphosate. And now you can find glyphosate in 60 to 100% of the air samples and rain samples in the Midwest. How is the environment affected by GMOs? You said if you introduce a GMO into the environment, the genes become a permanent feature of the gene pool. It gets passed on generation after generation. The only thing that lasts longer than a contaminated gene pool is extinction. Can you explain that at all in greater detail? Well, imagine if you released genetically engineered corn and it cross-pollinates with non-GMO corn. And then that seed becomes planted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Every single season, you have some level of contamination. With canola, same thing, but canola is in the brassica family, so that can cross with the brassicas like broccoli and Brussels sprouts. How are you going to recall the genes in the gene pool? This is a situation where we're creating new organisms that are not the products of the billions of years of evolution. Instead, they're the products of laboratory practices whose number one most common result is surprise side effects. And we're releasing it into the environment where it can irreversibly replace nature and corrupt the gene pool. Now, this was really bad in the very beginning, even when they only released a handful of GMOs. Consider now that gene editing is so cheap and so easy that individuals and companies all over the planet will be targeting anything with DNA in the hopes that they can come up with some kind of innovation to make money or gain greater control or ease. Now we're talking about genetically engineered bacteria, fungus, algae, insects, animals, plants, trees, grass. They literally could replace nature. Now what could go wrong? Anything. In the 1990s, they nearly introduced a genetically engineered bacteria that turned cellulose, plant matter, into alcohol. And they wanted to release it to farmers to mix with their crop stubble so they wouldn't have to burn it at the end of the season, and it would turn to alcohol so they could run their tractors. Then they were going to be instructed to take the sludge at the bottom of the barrel and spread it on their field. They were two weeks away from releasing the bacteria in an experiment just to see how far it spread. Well, the EPA actually did an experiment to see how far 
genetically engineered bacteria spread. And according to Elaine Ingham, a professor and doctor who was given the information privately by someone from the EPA, their study showed that the, the bacteria was spread all around the world within a few years, all over the world. So they were about to spread, they were about to release with EPA approval this genetically engineered bacteria. It's called Klebsiella planticola, and it was going to be released just to see how far it spread. And then they were going to send it out to farmers so that they could use it to create alcohol and spread the sludge on their, on their land as fertilizer. Two weeks before it got released, Elaine Ingham's graduate student, she was the advisor, came into a lab where he had taken that sludge and put it in with soil as part of his study that he was going to do to get his PhD and noticed that all of the wheat seeds and, and little plants had turned to slime, to mush. Because when he spread the sludge onto the field, it turned the plants into alcohol, killing them. And when I asked Dr. Elaine Ingham, what would that have meant if they released it in the environment? She said it could mean the end of terrestrial plant life. The end of terrestrial plant life, where we grow most of the food to feed humans. Because this particular genetically, this particular bacteria was found all over in every single plant that they tested. But if this new variety could have pushed out the natural variety because it would have turned things to alcohol, the alcohol would have killed the natural variety, but not the GMO variety. And so it would have replaced its natural parent and overtaken its role in nature and killed the terrestrial plant life, the roots, etc. So this was a near cataclysm, two weeks away from happening. And it wasn't the first time. In the 1980s, they nearly released genetically engineered bacteria that was to replace bacteria that causes frost to form. They wanted to protect the strawberries and the potatoes from damage from the frost. And what this bacteria does is it not, not only turns uh, precipitation into frost at much higher temperatures than would otherwise occur, it condenses water in clouds. It creates snow. And what if they released this genetically engineered bacteria and it took over and it out survived the natural version and ended up airborne? it could have changed the weather patterns on the planet. Now those are two bacteria that were almost released widely. Now you can do genetically engineered bacteria through CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. You can buy a kit, do-it-yourself kit, for 160 bucks. And you can flush your bacteria down the toilet and have an environmental release. Or you can buy a lab and build it for $2,000. Or if you're Monsanto, now Bayer, you can have, in fact, buildings full of robots driven by artificial intelligence to produce massive outputs of gene-edited GMOs. We're talking about the possibility of replacing nature, eliminating the products of the billions of years of evolution, and replacing it with accident-prone new versions that are unrecallable and irreversible. And when I talk about corrupting the gene pool, that's what happens to the individual plant. So you have mouse genes that were gene edited. The, the gene editing mechanism cuts the double-stranded DNA, and the cellular mechanism for the, for the mouse rejoins them. But it can grab DNA from the environment, meaning the Petri dish that has uh, cow or goat serum so we now find gene-edited mice that have retroviruses that were taken from cows or goats. We had hornless cattle that were created because they wanted to stuff more cattle into factory farms. So they took out the gene that created the horns. And they said, this is so safe and so predictable and such a perfect gene edit that there should be no regulation on gene-edited animals ever again. And they were breeding these for release in Brazil. And then the FDA came along and decided to sequence the actual genome and went, guess what, guys? You made a mistake. There's bacterial genes inside the cows now in every cell. 
In fact, there's antibiotic resistant genes. These genes, if, if they were released in cattle, could create antibiotic resistant diseases, which could cause death and unnecessary amputations. So we have genetically engineered bacteria, genetically engineered animals. We, have, we could have gene edited anything. And these unpredicted side effects could cause a catastrophe. We know what it's like when we have a single invasive species that grew in harmony with its environment, but when transferred to a new location, creates chaos. Imagine taking an ecosystem and replacing it all with gene edited alterations where you never quite know what's going to happen. It's a chance, <laughs> the chances of a catastrophe are near 100%. The chances of a cataclysm is something I don't even want to think about. Is there any reason to think that GMOs are having a detrimental impact on children's health? I was reading the final arguments of the third Monsanto trial, where Monsanto, now Bayer, got um, nailed for causing cancer for the plaintiffs. And my name came up because it was a memo that was picked up by this, the discovery. And I had just written an article about why children are most at risk from the potential dangers of GMOs. And these Monsanto executives were sicking a pseudoscientist on me because his, they had paid him a lot of money to come after me. And so they're saying, oh, Jeffrey's at it again. And they called the whole thing whack-a-mole. Like as soon as I came up with something, they would try and whack me down. And other Monsanto uh, executives responded saying, funny you should use the word whack-a-mole. We've been using that term to describe the same thing for two years. So I am a mole that they whack. And one of the reasons they try and whack is because I pointed out, truthfully, that children are most at risk. Now, why is that? First of all, they have more allergies than young adults and adults. And GMOs can increase allergic reactions in many ways. Toxins are more dangerous to kids for many reasons, in part because they eat more, more food per body weight than we do, and they also use food differently. They use food to build their systems, not just for fuel, so nutritional deficiencies end up expressing themselves structurally. They also don't have a well-developed blood-brain barrier or microbiome, and all of those things could be negatively influenced. So yes, children are most at risk, and we say, make sure if you're planning to have children, if you're planning to have children, shift to organic before you conceive, long before you conceive, but at least two weeks, because that'll give the, the chances for a lot of these chemicals to leave the blood. And during the process of being pregnant, don't eat anything but organics, because some of the sprays that they use on non-organic food are known to cause birth defects, like Roundup's uh, glyphosate, and also Liberty Link is a GMO that produces, if you spray Liberty on that, that's related to brain deformities. You don't want to use GMOs or the chemicals when you're pregnant. In fact, there are many people who can't get pregnant these days. The infertility rates are through the roof. In a film that I created with Amy Hart, we went to a chiropractor's office where a lot of infertile couples come. And she puts all of the infertile couples on organic diets and they all end up with children, all of them. The last time I spoke to her, 123 couples have kids. They were not able to have kids before she saw them, zero failures. So that not only is more dangerous for kids, but if you don't switch to organic, you may not be able to have the kids. The World Health Organization declared glyphosate a probable human carcinogen. Please explain exactly what they said and what the significance of that was. IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, is the top agency in the world to determine what, is, what causes cancer and what doesn't. And they get a bunch of independent scientists, they hand them out all of the research data, they study it on their own, they meet and they convene and they discuss and then they categorize. And they determined that glyphosate, the chief poison in Roundup, is a class 2A carcinogen. It means it's a probable human carcinogen. Now, why wasn't it definitely a carcinogen? Because there wasn't enough human studies. There was enough animal studies, and they said it definitely causes cancer in animals. Definitely in animals, probably in humans. And 
It causes genotoxicity and oxidative stress, which can cause the damage to the DNA, which can cause the cancer. And if you look at where it's been sprayed, there's higher levels of cancer. So they look at epidemiological and animal feeding studies and this causation of what happens in the cell, genotoxicity. In all three cases, there was evidence that it causes cancer. Since then, we now know that it can reduce the ability of cells to communicate with each other. It's called gap junctions. And it reduces it in one study, not yet published, by 50%. That's a well-known causal pathway leading to cancer. We also know, and I don't know if this is published yet, that it damages the structural integrity of cells. And what can happen is it can destroy the mitochondria. And people can see it in a microscope. And there are many uh, researchers who believe that cancer is a mitochondrial disease. So when you destroy the mitochondria, you might end up with cancer, but it's also linked to lifespan and many other diseases, brain fog, fatigue, etc. So there are many reasons why glyphosate probably causes cancer. Now, there was a study done after the World Health Organization's committee did their research that looked at, they looked at mouse cells and they put in glyphosate, it was breast cancer, and it did not multiply the breast cancer cells until they added another uh, substance which is found in every human being. Then it multiplied. So on its own, it wasn't multiplying, but when they were added a substance to the mix, then it was multiplying. And glyphosate, or the use of Roundup in the United States, is correlated as it increases, it's correlated with the same slope of increase in many different types of cancers, liver, kidney, uh, bladder cancer, leukemia, breast cancer. And if you look at dogs, they have the highest cancer rate of any mammal, one out of every 1.6. The amount of glyphosate in their urine is 40 times that of humans because there's such a certain amount in their pet food, and that's all they eat is the pet food over and over again, the dog food, and it contains a high level of glyphosate. And that's not, not even counting what's picked up by their paws. And we believe that the cancer epidemic, which came very recently after GMOs were introduced, is because of glyphosate. In fact, I've interviewed many veterinarians who said before then, it was a very rare occurrence, maybe one in a month. Now it's several times per day, along with other specific symptoms that we link to glyphosate and GMOs in dog food. Cats are also have, have a high level of cancer. And remember what the World Health Organization's committee said. It does cause cancer in animals. Is there glyphosate in our drinking water? And if so, how would it get in the water? Glyphosate is airborne. By the time it's sprayed so often and so much in the fields in the Midwest and the West, it ends up in the air, in the rain, and in the surface water and the groundwater. It's water soluble. Now, there have been tests of tap water and they found glyphosate in some of them, not most. It's in so much food, but is not as popular or not as frequently found in the water supply. What does that mean for, for you individually? I don't know, because if you have it, you're drinking it every day and you're bathing in it. And, for, and fortunately, there are filters that can filter it out. How do we get Roundup out of our body? Roundup is water soluble. Most of it is, goes out with the urine, but some goes to the organs, and some goes, ends up in the bone. And some of that is gone out of the body within two weeks, and some remains. So if you simply stop exposing yourself to Roundup, then the amount in your urine should drop dramatically, and the amount that's built up in your tissues should start to release, but that doesn't mean you're gonna be 100% off the hook. There's a lot of theories about what to do to release the Roundup from the body, and also how to repair and rebuild the body after its exposure. I'm not an expert at that. And people ask me the question, what more can I do besides eating organic? And I used to say, it's above my pay grade. And I wasn't qualified to answer the question. But I'm way overqualified to ask the questions, and I did that to 18 experts. And I have an online course called Healing from GMOs and Roundup, which you can find at healingfromgmos.com. 
where I ask the question, and some people talk about a detoxification of the liver and how to bolster that with either supplements, and some people talk about certain foods. We know that the liver detoxification mechanism is partly disabled because glyphosate damages a particular pathway. It also can damage the NRF2 uh, pathway, which helps the cells detox all over the body. So it's like the king of toxins. When you have glyphosate, all the other toxins that are inhibited in terms of their release can be damaging the body. So you really want to figure out how to detox. So some of these people use saunas, some of these people use uh, diet, some of these people use supplements. And I'm not going to condense it and try and say what's the best because it's above my pay grade. So I'll just say take a look at healingfromgmos.com and see for yourself. Are GMO crops contaminating all the non-GMO crops, including organic crops? Please explain. You plant corn, genetically engineered, upwind. Downwind, you have non-GMO corn. Now, it depends on the timing. If this one is tasseling, when this one's pollinating, and it can cross, and it can certainly cause cross-pollination and contamination. A lot of the contamination, however, is from the harvesting equipment. If you harvest a GMO here, and you don't clean the equipment out, which can take hours and hours, many hours, and you're at harvest time, so you're just renting equipment, and now you're using it, now when you take that harvested material and you put it into storage, it's already contaminated from the next door neighbors. When you put it in the storage, did you clean out the storage? When you transport it, did it happen to be mixed during the process of transportation? Sometimes there's accidental mixing where you think you're using non-GMO, but you're actually using GMO. So whether it's trans transferring of pollen, of seeds, of storage, of transport, there's a lot of ways that GMOs can mix with non-GMOs. Now, not every type of crop will cross with every other type of crop. Uh, soybeans self-pollinate. They don't cross-pollinate, so their level of contamination is less. Canola easily cross-pollinates, and the seeds fly through the air. So you end up with a lot of contamination in canola, so much so that organic canola growers tried to have a class action lawsuit because they couldn't grow organic anymore that wasn't contaminated. But it was struck down by a court that was friendly to Monsanto. Stephanie Senoff from MIT says that one out of two children would have autism by the year 2032. Did she think that GMOs were a factor in that prediction? Stephanie Senoff, who's a friend of mine, is a senior researcher at MIT in the artificial intelligence labs. She has another degree in biology. And she's an expert at manipulating large data to see patterns, to come up with causal pathways. So she decided to take on autism. She knew something was new in the environment because it was a fairly new explosion of an epidemic, and it was increasing year after year, and it wasn't just better detection methods. It was clearly new on the horizon. So she took all the data from all the published studies on autism and characterize what was happening biochemically, what was happening in the system. And she said, I could tell you why an autistic child would have the particular symptoms that they have based on the, on the deficiencies and the other things that were occurring in the body. But I couldn't figure out what was causing those deficiencies and changes. So she took every single chemical that she knew, agricultural chemical, things like that, that was, that's popular, and she pulled all the big data on those, and nothing fit. Nothing seemed to cause those particular problems that the autistic community was, was, had. And then she went to a lecture by another friend of mine, Dr. Uh, Don Huber, professor emeritus from Purdue University. And he's an expert at Roundup and glyphosate. He even did consulting for Monsanto. And he started talking about the nature of glyphosate how it chelates minerals, how it creates, how it's an antibiotic and kills beneficial bacteria, and all these different things. Went two hours, and Stephanie said she was on the edge of her seat. She left that lecture convinced that she had found the chemical that she never even heard of before the lecture. So she pulled all the data on glyphosate, and sure enough, it fit hand in glove with the changes that she saw 
in autistic children. And so then she and Nancy Swanson did epidemiological evaluations and they pulled all these different ways to calculate the prevalence of autistic uh, children in the United States, autism of six-year-olds and total prevalence, etc. And she ran it against the amount of Roundup that was being sprayed on GMO soy and corn. And in the most recent version, she did six-year-olds with autism, but it wasn't just that year's Roundup, because if they were six years old, they were being exposed to Roundup for many years. So for mathematical reasons, she chose four years of exposure, that year and the previous three years, which gives a better idea of the exposure to the children. She ran the graph, and the correlation was nearly perfect. If it was perfect, it would be a 1. It was 0 0.9973. So she, she said that correlation, correlation doesn't prove causation, but given that we understand the causal pathways, and we also know that oftentimes kids with autism, when they switch to organic food, get better. In fact, in the film Secret Ingredients that I did with Amy Hart, there are two autistic boys in the film that are no longer on the spectrum. They're no longer diagnosed in the spectrum. What do their family do? They switch to organic. And this is not the only two that I've heard about. I've heard about it over and over and over again. Some get better, some actually are off the spectrum altogether. It doesn't work, work that way like magic with everyone, but it so often happens. I say if you have a kid with any problem, including autism, switch to organic and see, see what happens. Dr. Michelle Perro in our film, pediatrician, says autism is curable, meaning it can, depending on where they are in the spectrum, it can be cured can be overcome, and sometimes dramatic changes with food alone. And she'll, she'll t say to a family, switch to organic for the sake of your autistic child, and all of a sudden the, the father's kidney problems are better, the daughter's ADD is better, the mother's lost weight, and they, she wasn't even treating them. They were just switching to organic in order to accommodate the autistic son. And that hap that's happened before. So, we know that glyphosate is also found in vaccines. So there's an exposure to glyphosate in young children through vaccines. And we also know that when parents are exposed to glyphosate, it damages their gut bacteria and their whole microbiome can be off. And it's the parent, the mother, her microbiome that inoculates the child during the birth process. And so if her, gut, if her bacteria is off, then it could also create bacterial problems for the child. And we also know that gut bacteria dysbiosis is one of the problems, one of the aspects that we see a lot with autistic kids. We also know that digestive problems are, are often uh, associated and that we found a lot of information that GMOs and Roundup damage the digestive tract and damage the ability to digest food. And that's just a couple of the things that we can link. What are the goals of the genetically modified food industry? The main reason they genetically engineer crops is to sell more chemicals. The Roundup Ready sells more Roundup. The Liberty Link sells more Liberty. Those are herbicides. And 85% of the GMOs in the world are herbicide tolerant, mostly Roundup Ready. There's also the second most common category are soy, or not soy, soy in South America plus cotton and uh, and corn also in North America, they produce their own insecticide. So you actually eat the corn on the cob and you're eating an insecticide and oftentimes it's, B, it's called BT. Oftentimes it's not only BT corn but it's Roundup Ready corn. So you're eating Roundup residues plus an insecticide plus the GMOs and I wouldn't do it if I were you. <laughs> so they claim that the reason is to feed the world but if they were actually motivated by feeding the world they'd never make those type of GMOs. In fact, the GMOs that they make don't increase average yield. Sometimes they lower yield, and they claim that it's supposed to increase yield, but it, it's varied. And agroecological practices can increase, can double yield in developing countries, even triple yield, especially in the staples. And so you have a situation where if you really wanted to feed the world, you'd have nothing to do with GMOs. And that was the conclusion made by the ISTAD report, which was produced in 2008 with over 400 scientists commissioned by the UN and the World Bank. It's the most comprehensive evaluation of how to feed the world. And their conclusion was GMOs have nothing to offer. 
Are there any studies or research showing the health dangers from GMOs? Yes, I collect them. I trade them with my friends. It's like baseball cards for me. Yeah, there's a lot. They show potentially precancerous cell growth in the digestive tract, smaller brains, livers, and testicles, uh, partial atrophy of the liver, damaged immune system. That was one study in 1990, um, 1990s. Then there was things that show higher uh, mortality, problems with the liver, problems with the kidneys, problem with the organ enzymes, altered biochemistry, damaged junk sperm cells, damaged reproductive organs. Um, we see problems if, of reproduction, uh, birth defects. Uh, it goes on and on. And some of them repeat the same thing, immune system problems, digestive problems, reproductive problems, accelerated aging. Uh, and these, some of these were cited by the American Academy of Environmental Medicine in their paper that said all doctors should prescribe non-GMO diets to all patients. And when they started to, they reported to me that their patients were getting better. Now there's thousands of doctors prescribing organic diets and reporting dramatic improvements. Some of them are in the film, Secret Ingredients. You said the most in-depth research study to date on GMO health showed massive damage. Tell us about the study and what did the biotech industry do to get people not to believe the study? Well, there's two in-depth studies that I've talked about. One was from Dr. Arpad Pustai from 1999, 1998. He went on TV answering some questions and saying that he didn't think that the public should be used as guinea pigs for an uh, experiment on GMOs, and that he wouldn't put them in his mouth. Why? Because he had done the most sophisticated studies on GMOs and found out that the process itself, irrespective of what gene you put in, the mere process of genetic engineering caused all these problems, potentially precancerous cell growth in the digestive tract, smaller brains, livers, and testicles, partial atrophy of the liver, damaged immune system in 10 days. Now, he was fired from his job after 35 years and silenced with threats of a lawsuit. We understand that it was Monsanto that called, called the Clinton White House, Clinton called Tony Blair, the uh, Prime Minister's office called um, Professor Philip James, who was uh, Dr. Arpad Pustai's boss, and the next day Pustai was fired. And they put out a massive disinformation campaign to try and destroy his reputation in order to protect the reputation of biotechnology. Eventually he was invited to speak before parliament the gag order was lifted, he got his data back, it's published in The Lancet and other places, and it shows that the process of genetic engineering is unsafe. But by the time that came out, there was such confusion and such misreporting that it didn't have its day in court, so to speak. Similarly, Dr. Uh, G.E. Seralini, Professor Seralini, did a two-year study on rats. He showed that Roundup-ready corn and Roundup, individually or together, caused multiple massive tumors, early death, and organ damage. It was the most comprehensive study, the longest study. It could have and should have stopped the use of GMOs around the world. Instead, this massive disinformation campaign used its own campaign as an echo chamber, claiming it was consensus and it was just their own paid people and pseudoscientists and front groups saying the same talking points that were distributed by Monsanto's PR firm. And that ended up causing doubt among both the regulators around the world and those that were reporting on it. And so they, Dr. Seralini was eventually awarded um, an award for being a whistleblower. His stuff was published and vindicated, but it did not have the impact that it should have had, again, because of the massive attack campaign that is regularly unleashed on any scientist who dares to discover problems. You said that over 90% of the soy, corn, cotton, canola, and sugar beet crops in the U.S. are GMO. Why is such a high percentage of these crops GMO, and why is that a problem? It's interesting that Monsanto, before they were purchased by Bayer, went on a shopping spree themselves and bought up all these seed companies and created motivation for the seed, the seed dealers to sell the GMO version they sometimes eliminated the best performing non-GMO version, so you could only buy the GMO version. Um, there was all sorts of economic incentives and elimination of alternatives uh, to push these out. And all of the crops that you mentioned are Roundup Ready, which makes it easier to weed. So if you have a large farm, you could weed without the farmers by just running a tractor or flying a plane 
and spraying right over the top. So you don't have to spot apply. You can just broad scale sp uh, spread your poison all around. It gets absorbed into the food. We eat it if we eat the GMOs. Um, so it's easier to weed. It makes farming easier, less time consuming, less labor costs. And in some cases, you have trouble, trouble getting non-GMO seed that does well in your area. Right now, you can't get a non-GMO sugar beet seed. You can't get sugar beets. They're all GMO, 100%. In some areas, I talk to farmers in their area, they can't get high-performing non-GMO seed. It's been taken over. Who makes up the biotech industry, and why are they so powerful in influencing the media and the government? I've been following them for a long time. Why? It's hard to say, but I'll tell you some of their tactics. Monsanto's the, the big dog. They were purchased by Bayer. Uh, Dow and DuPont merged. Syngenta was bought by ChemChina. BASF is another one. These are the traditional ones that produce the GMO crops. But now the biotech industry has all sorts of new people, new groups that are trying to create genetically modified insects. Oxitec out of the UK. Or um, there's genetically modified salmon, Aqua Bounty. Uh, so we have these new types of GMOs with new, new groups. Um, but if you look at the, like the Monsanto influence, uh, Henry Miller, who was a very pro-GMO person within the FDA, somehow state, made the statement that was picked up by the New York Times. He said that the, that the regulatory agencies have done everything that Big Ag has asked them to do and told them to do. Big Ag meaning Monsanto. Their, their influence in Washington has been legendary. They make financial contributions to both sides, the Democrat and Republican. They have tremendous dollars spent on lobbying. Um, they have, they've been focusing on politics, farmers, academia, and media. Those are the primary focus. And they have like public relations firms that will rate different reporters and reward those that, that report positively and attack those that don't. I've made this very clear in my book how they did that with GMOs, with bovine growth hormone. Um, they're pretty aggressive. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine, Carrie Gillum, who's talked at this at Truth About Real Truth About Health before. She said they tried intimidated, intimidation tactics on her, and were probably trained in them, and tried to get her kicked off the, the beat because she was writing for Reuters and exposing the truth. So they have aggressive tactics. They had relationships with the defense industry. Uh, they have um, pretty bold, amazing, um, negative campaigns that we wouldn't think would be possible now. Just completely blatant violation of ethics, blatant violation of science, and they get away with it. You know, when they, when they were doing research on Roundup to see if it was absorbed by human skin, they used a human cadaver, which is typical, 10% absorbed, 3.3 times the allowable level, never reported it to the EPA, cut the skin off a cadaver, baked it in an oven, froze it, then applied the Roundup, it was absorbed. Almost none. So that's what they reported. They didn't say that they baked it so, and, and froze it so it was leather-like. They pretended. Completely blatant fraud. And uh, oftentimes there's a, there's a uh, revolving door between Monsanto and various regulatory agencies and the executive branch. The person in charge of FDA policy that created the policy on GMOs and their, and their bovine growth hormone was a former Monsanto attorney, later Monsanto vice president, later FDA food czar. Um, there was the administrator of the EPA, William Ruckelshaus. He was, uh, became on Monsanto board. For Mickey Cantor, the former US trade representative, Monsanto's board. So many people back and forth between various regulatory agencies and different aspects of the executive branch. And even in the, even in the legal side, in the courts, Clarence Thomas was an attorney for Monsanto. Another guy who was an attorney for, on record for Monsanto never released that information, took on a, he was a judge, took on a case that was against Monsanto and denied a class action so it dissolved, and only the New York Times reported and revealed to everyone that he actually had been a 
uh, a, a attorney of record for Monsanto. You've mentioned many of them. Can you tell me what crops are currently genetically modified and which ones are they considering genetically, genetically modified? Okay, crops that are GMOs. Soy, that are on the market for sale that we know about. Soy, corn, cotton, which is used for cottonseed oil, canola, sugar beets, alfalfa, zucchini, yellow squash, apple, potato, plus there's salmon, which is genetically engineered and sold in Canada, and it may be sold as early this year in the United States. Um, so that's 10 crops and, and a fish. Now, there's a gene-edited non-browning mushroom that was approved and never, as far as I know, it wasn't introduced. But they didn't need to, they, you don't need to tell the FDA if you introduce a GMO. And the people that created the non-browning mushroom sent a letter to the USDA and said, you don't need to evaluate us. And they said, no, no, it's gene editing. You didn't transfer genes between species. Not our problem. So, and we don't know if there's rogue scientists in China that are creating genetically engineered whatever and sending it to the US without telling us. They don't have to legally. It's basically, you know, the, the loose regulations are going to turn around and bite us because we, we don't even know what we're eating. But for now, we, we think that these are the 10. Soy, corn, cotton, canola, sugar beets, alfalfa, zucchini, yellow squash, um, oh, Hawaiian papaya, apples, and potatoes, 11. Apples and potatoes. I missed one. I was like, why is it 10 and not 11? I guess I've been miscounting all these years. No, I just miscounted. What have you learned about Monsanto based on all the time you've spent researching them and their industry? A former Monsanto scientist told me that three of his colleagues were testing the milk from cows treated with Monsanto's bovine growth hormone, found so much of a cancer-promoting hormone in the milk, IGF-1, that they stopped drinking milk. Unless it was organic, one bought his own cow. And uh, he also told me that when they found that corn fed to rats caused problems, instead of withdrawing the corn, they redesigned, they rewrote the study to hide the effect. Now, none of that, none of that surprised me. But it's indicative of a corporate culture that is the worst of human characteristics. Willing to expose the entire population to something that you know could hurt or kill them. This scientist was, that I talked to was no longer working at Monsanto, and he said, the rats were fed corn for 90 days. In southern Africa, they ate corn three times a day as a staple their whole lives. And the percentage of corn was higher than the rats were fed. Rats are typically fed up to 33% of the corn in Monsanto's study. In Africa, you could eat 50 or 70% in times of famine, 90% of your caloric intake as corn. He said to me, I got very concerned about what was going to happen in Southern Africa. Years later, and this is reported in my film, Genetic Roulette, I was talking to a veterinarian in the U.S. who had a South African client whose pigs and cows were, had serious health problems. He was losing money. The veterinarian said, don't feed him GMOs. So he grew non-GMO corn and started feeding his animals the non-GMO corn. They got better, and then he ran out, had to buy corn from the market. They got worse. Then he had enough corn grown on his land to feed them year-round, non-GMO, and they got better. The people working on his farm were sick. He needed 50. He had to keep 60 employed because 20% were always too sick to work. He was spending a lot of money on medicines, severe flu-like symptoms, headaches, inflammation. And he told the veterinarian once or twice a month he'd be talking to a worker and we'd notice that the eyes would move in different directions from each other. And he knew from experience that within one or two days they would be dead. He didn't know why. They were eating the corn he was growing for the animals 
which was 100% genetically engineered. So these people on this farm were eating more GMO crops, corn in particular, than perhaps anywhere else on the planet except in other farms in similar situations. And they had a massive health issue with high death rate. Then when he switched to non-GMO corn, the workers started eating non-GMO corn, and they got better until he ran out. The same thing happened with the animals, happened with the workers. He hadn't realized what was going on. No one knew. And so the concern by the Monsanto scientist who had left Monsanto appears to be the reality. That the people in southern Africa who are like the canaries in the coal mine, the people eating more than any other humans, are getting seriously ill. So there are people in Monsanto who used to work in Monsanto. Another person, Kirk Azevedo, used to sell for Monsanto. He discovered some of their practices, tried to blow the whistle, was ostracized. He left the company, said, I don't want to be part of that disaster. I interview him, and it's in my book and one of my movies. So we have a situation where not everyone who works for Monsanto is a bad person. But I've talked to people who could not handle that culture that was willing to put up with such reckless and dangerous behaviors, and they left. When I think about the kind of rigged research and attacks that they've done around the world, just one idea, just one concept, just to throw one more in. They, want, they wanted to introduce Terminator technology into GMO crops so that you could not grow the offspring, so that it, was, it would create sterile seeds. And they were going to target the 1.4 billion farmers that save seeds around the world. Now, the saving of seeds creates this massive biodiversity, millions upon millions of varieties, which is necessary for food security. If there's a disease, if there's a famine, if there's climate change, you take these other species that you're growing and you use them and you are, become a savior. Otherwise, if it's just a monocrop, you end up with a potato famine and you can wipe out and kill people. Monsanto was willing to risk the food security of the planet, hoping to introduce terminator seeds into all varieties to force all of the farmers in the world to just buy the seeds in the catalog, to narrow the diversity on the planet so that they can make more money, which would almost certainly ultimately result in massive numbers of deaths. So this is the type of thinking that they have. How many different types of genetic modification are there today? How many new types are they trying to add? Well, there's gene editing, and there's a lot of types of gene editing. With gene editing, you create a molecular scissors, and it cuts the DNA. And you have a guide that you attach to it and say, okay, look for this sequence. Got it? Cut. And you can get fairly precise with cutting it, but it can also cut here and here and here and here in these, quote, non-target areas which can wreak havoc. You can have hundreds or thousands of mutations. And then when the cell by itself reattaches, you don't have any control. And that's when more damage can occur, or more additions or subtractions. So they found that they would have used this gene editing for knocking out genes, to shut them down. And they kept doing it, saying, oh, we're knocking out, we're knocking out, we're knocking out. But they'd never checked to see if it actually knocked it out. One recent study found out it did 136 knockouts, and guess what? One third continued to express proteins. Some of them were truncated. What happens when you have a truncated protein? It could be an allergen, or a toxin, or a carcinogen. So the gene-edited non-browning mushroom might cause allergies or toxins or cancer, and we don't know. They may never have tested to see if their knockout worked. So gene editing is one. You can also use something to create RNA, RNA as a silencer. So double-stranded RNA, little piece of RNA, it will match up with the DNA piece and silence the gene. However, if you bite the apple that uses that double-stranded RNA or that potato, these are engineered not to turn brown when you slice them because it's supposed to silence the browning gene, that same double-stranded DNA might silence our DNA reprogram our genetic expression. And we know that that type of thing does happen between species. It does survive 
digestion. It can get into the bloodstream, and there's no real reason why it shouldn't happen. So I say never eat the innate potato or the arctic apple, in my opinion. You have something called synthetic biology, which we can call two different ways. One is to build organisms from scratch. The other is to take organisms like yeast or bacteria and turn them into little factories. They did this in the 1980s in Japan to create L-tryptophan, a food supplement. And they did so to try and create it more economically, but they ended up getting contaminants, almost certainly from the process of genetic engineering, which killed about 100 Americans and caused five to 10,000 to fall sick or become permanently disabled. Now you have companies like the Impossible Burger using genetically engineered yeast to create a protein that's never been in the human food supply before. It's leg hemoglobin from the root of a soybean plant. And the process of creating that, that yeast creates 26 other uncharacterized proteins plus a bunch of other metabolites. They just scoop it up and put it all in the burger. People are, be, are reporting getting sick. There's now a collection of data of people getting sick from the Impossible Burger. You don't even have to be focused on this leg hemoglobin or the 46 uncharacterized proteins. They use Roundup Ready soy sprayed with Roundup. I wouldn't touch the stuff, but that's another genetically engineered system. And they want to use that kind of synthetic bio. They're already creating synthetic vanilla. They want to do saffron. They want to do CBD. They want to do uh, certain herbal properties. They can displace entire ecosystems, entire civilizations and cultures that have been built around creating certain spices and, and Ayurvedic herbs and Chinese herbs by creating things in laboratories that may have vast side effects that we don't know about. There's something called gene drives where usually if you have a male and a female and they mate, then half of the offspring get the approximately get the genes from one and half the offspring get it from the other. The gene drives will force the offspring to get the desired trait. And it'll pass on that gene genetic engineering mechanism so that the offspring will then pass it on, will then pass it on, then pass it on. So every single offspring from those parents will have that trait. And they want to genetically engineer things like a self-destructive gene. So it'll only create sterile males or it'll only create something that'll kill off species so they can kill off certain types of mosquitoes, kill off um, mice or rats that have ended up in certain islands that shouldn't be there. And these things could theoretically transfer to other species, causing problems for their whole gene pool. And sometimes they don't, they have the side effects, which can be spread throughout the whole gene pool. And sometimes the genetically engineered trait will change or shut off. So they're playing with fire here, and yet they're still trying to go ahead with these gene drives. The Department of Defense is working on something called HEGAs, which are insects that can deposit viruses in the field, and the viruses have the genetic engineering mechanism in it so that the genetic engineering takes place in the field. We mentioned the double-stranded RNA already built into crops. There's now sprays with RNA where you spray on the crop and it changes the gene expression. What happens if it gets on your skin? We don't know. It could change your gene expression theoretically. There's genetically engineered well, there's also things that are like culturing meat and cloning, which I don't get into because it's not the type of, of DNA manipulation that I look at. But there are, I actually, there, there's probably types of genetic engineering that no one knows about except the Department of Defense or the elite places that are keeping it a secret. What's common to all of them is surprise side effects. The most common outcome, surprise side effects. Now, it's interesting. The side effects can happen in non-target places. Mutations, hundreds, thousands of them up and down the DNA. But even if you got it right and forced the overexpression of a particular gene so it was producing more RNA and more proteins than it ever expressed on its own, even if it's doing exactly what you want, you still don't have control over the outcome. You still don't know what's going to happen. One gene can create a thousand different proteins through process of gene of splicing up the RNA and rearranging it. Alternate splicing can create all sorts of proteins that are not tested. When you create all that much energy in producing one thing, you may take the energy away from producing something else. When you flood the cell with a particular outcome of a protein, the cell may react to it. 
the L-tryptophan, the bacteria that created the L-tryptophan, the tryptophan was toxic to the bacteria. So now it's creating tryptophan, it's toxic to the bacteria. What does the bacteria do? We don't know. They never tested it. Maybe that was producing another compound that was one of the five or six compounds that was related to the epidemic. So even if it does the thing that you want it to do, we still don't know enough about the DNA to safely release it into the environment or the food supply. That's the problem. What's different with the topic of GMOs compared with five years ago and even one year ago? One of the main differences now is the cheapness of gene editing, where you can buy a gene editing kit, do it yourself for $161 on Amazon. And also the biotech industry realized that we got the upper hand on GMOs, we educating activists. We taught people about the health dangers, and we, can, we exposed their dirty laundry, and no one believed them anymore, and people are seeking non-GMO by the droves, 46% of Americans seeking non-GMO food. So it's, it's destroyed their plan to genetically engineer 100% of all the commercial seeds in the world and patent them. So they're determined to convince the, hum the people and the regulatory agencies that gene editing is safe and predictable and should just be called breeding. So it should have absolutely no oversight. And they convinced the Australian government. And they've pretty much convinced the US government who's trying to implement those kind of regulatory uh, hands-off policies and to force the rest of the world to. So that's what's going on right now is this big worldwide fight over what regulatory requirements are there for gene editing. Europe says they're going to treat it like GMOs. They have some requirements for health studies, not sufficient to protect the public, but it'll at least force some of these gene edited products to be tested. So we would want it even more rigorous, and the biotech industry is trying to force Europe to relinquish and to change their policy. They've gotten Japan on their side, the biotech industry. They've gotten Brazil and Argentina and Chile, and of course, you know, as they say, the, the U.S. President Trump signed an executive order on June 11th in, 19, in 2019 to essentially eviscerate um, oversight, regulatory oversight, and to push uh, gene editing around the world to convince the world that it was safe and to try and uh, arm wrestle the regulatory agencies into compliance so that, that U.S. gene edited products would be picked up all over the world. Why are you concerned about GMOs and the mainstream media, including the New York Times, doesn't seem to think it's a problem? The four areas that Monsanto's PR um, focus on, media, government, farmers, academia. The media has been misreporting, have been missing the details. Um, a lot of people that do report accurately are attacked by Monsanto. They have a very sophisticated way of rating uh, reporters, of rewarding those that work with them. They'll fly reporters in from other countries. They work with the State Department so that the State Department recommends that reporters from other countries come and be wine and dine by Monsanto. They get to visit the uh, St. Louis facilities, etc. cetera. Um, and they're also in charge of a narrative that gets sent out through their front groups and their reporters and their pseudoscientists. Um, and they also can withhold money, research money or, or donations. And so they have a lot of leverage on, on academic institutions. We've seen this. It's not just, we're not just making this up. We know exactly this is what they've done. They threatened to hold back money. They threatened positions. They're very forceful. They have a, a line item called let nothing go. If anyone mentions anything about GMOs, if, certainly if there's, a, if there's a scientist that comes out against GMOs, they're attacked. So they also will create rigged research that the, the normal press won't pick up on. They'll just look at the conclusions and they'll hear the credentialed scientists say this is solid. And the thing is, at the same time they say it's solid, they'll say those who are against it are anti-science. In other words, those of us who are calling for more science were anti-science. So the mainstream media has been doing a rather poor job. And we sometimes get in there. I've been on Dr. Oz a couple of times. I've been on The Doctors a couple of times. 
But mostly, we get the information out through more specialized channels, online, social media now a lot. And now the online bosses, the Google searches, the Facebooks, um, YouTube, they're actually becoming extremely biased. And they're eliminating accounts altogether. They're redirecting search engines, search searches, so that you're, you don't end up getting the truth. You get what their sponsors want or what they want, et cetera. So it used to be that the internet was our, our trusted alternative. Now we have to be careful about which search engine we use and how we, how we get the information out in order to, to make sure that the truth gets out to the people that need to hear it. Um, but the mainstream media coverage in Europe about a high profile food safety scandal related to GMOs in 1999 with Dr. Arpad Pustai caused the tipping point of consumer rejection in Europe and it was described as one of the 10 most underreported events of the year in the US by Project Censored. And you could tell that the biotech industry did a full court press on the press so that they would not report like Europe did because Europe rejected GMOs because of the coverage. And it wasn't the European Commission or the European Food Safety Authority who are both pro-GMO. It was the people that, got, that said they don't want it and it was Nestle's and Unilever and McDonald's and Burger King and others who responded to the people who responded to the press. So that's one reason why locking down the mainstream media was a priority for years by the biotech industry. Why do you think there's a correlation between the growth of GMOs and different diseases? Haven't a lot of things changed in the last 20 years and therefore a lot of things would correlate with the increase in all these human diseases? What's interesting is that when people get rid of GMOs in their diet, or specifically if they switch to organic, so they're getting rid of GMOs and Roundup, because Roundup is sprayed on a lot of non-GMO crops, they report getting better from a variety of diseases. And I've asked 150 lectures, including a couple of dozen of them at medical conferences, and the doctors reporting on behalf of thousands of people, and it was consistent. Digestive was number one, uh, brain fog and fatigue was number two, and there was weight problems and mood issues, and skin conditions and all sorts of things. So we surveyed 3,256 people and they, got, they reported getting better from the same 28 conditions that we heard in these lectures. And we talked to veterinarians who reported the animals getting better from these same conditions, both livestock and pets. So we actually have evidence of changing health issues when people switch from GMO and Roundup laden food to non-GMO, non-Roundup. We also have the animal feeding studies where the animals who are force fed these products have the same conditions or their precursors in just 90 days. And you can see from the precursors, you could predict from those these particular set of diseases. So you have su substantial anecdotal evidence and case studies from doctors. You have cause plausible causative pathways. And you have also the epidemiological evidence with more than 30 diseases rising in parallel with the increased use of GMOs and Roundup. Then if you look at what is the mode of action of GMOs, BT toxin, and Roundup, you can also predict these things. When you put all these together, the case is pretty strong. What kind of modes of, of action? Let's talk about just Roundup for a second because more research has been done on Roundup than on GMOs or the BT toxin that's produced in some GMOs. So just look at Roundup. It damages the foundation of health, the ability to absorb minerals, the gut microbiome, it can create leaky gut, it can create birth defects, it can kill, da damage the mitochondria, it can cause the deficiency of neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine, and melatonin, it can cause uh, hormonal imbalance, it can cause suppressed digestive enzymes. So these are, these are fundamental in the ability for cells to communicate with themselves, the ability of the, of the liver to detox, the ability of our cells to detox. They can create leaky brain. All of these have been documented, okay, whether it's in a test tube or in a human or in an animal, suggesting that they're going on in the entire population. If you look at just one of these things, just one, the gut bacteria, and you look at the changes that Roundup can do to the gut bacteria, I've asked an expert at gut bacteria, I listed the 28 different conditions that people got better from, and he said every single one of them could be predicted as a result of just changing the gut bacteria. 
We talk about leaky gut. That can be predictive of cancer, heart disease, uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, autoimmune disease, um, food sensitivities, and allergies. You talk about the mitochondrial damage that can be predictive of brain fog, fatigue, potential cancer, and, and, and accelerated aging. Each one of these can be predictive of these particular diseases. You put them all together, and it's a devastating case against Roundup alone. It also damages, I didn't even mention that it damages the DNA and could lead to cancer. So we understand now with the personal experience, the animal experience, the animal feeding studies, the epidemiological evidence, the modes of action, we have a tight case as to why it is likely, it is likely the most serious, impactful thing in terms of negative health that we're facing today. GMOs and Roundup, we'll put them together. Your information seems compelling, and what's been the response when you have presented this to influential people around the world? Um, what's been the response from the media, the universities, the scientific community, the medical community, the government agencies, and the medical industry? It all depends on access. You know, if I get a chance to speak to an open-minded scientist, whether he's pro-GMO or anti-GMO, they come around to a serious understanding of why this stuff is dangerous. I was speaking to a molecular biologist today who was totally on board. Molecular biology is the, is the group that does the genetic engineering. She was like, and I started, as soon as I heard that she was a molecular biologist, she was on board, but I just started talking about the, some of the details in scientific jargon. And she was like, yeah, I know, yeah, I know, yeah, I know. I talked years ago, I talked to someone who was pro-GMO. She was a professor, I think I was speaking at the college. And I started to explain the research that they don't do and the things that could go wrong. She was furious at the biotech industry because she had been brainwashed thinking it was safe. When I talk to um, you know, politicians, if they have the time and they take the time, they're convinced. But oftentimes, they don't give me access if they've already drank the Kool-Aid. Like I was, I was brought by people in Australia. They published my book, Genetic Roulette, gave it to all the elected officials in the country. And they flew me around because they were trying to prevent the release of genetically engineered canola. So in the states that were keeping the moratorium, I got a chance to speak to all the ministers of agriculture and some ministers of health, and, and it was no problem. In the two states that they were planning to release it, I never got the meeting. Three weeks later after I left, they released the canola, and everything I had predicted to the other agricultural ministers came true. They ended up losing their premium. They lost some of their marketplace. There was contamination. There was no benefit to the farmers, just as they'd been is the opposite of what they had been promised by the biotech industry. But I have no access. So it really depends. And a lot of times, the biotech industry works overtime to prevent people like me from speaking to decision makers. But when we do, we can turn things around. What can an individual do who wants to help stop GMOs? I would say an individual should eat organic, so protect your own life and your family, share information with others, and I recommend subscribing to our information. I'm going to give two websites, responsibletechnology.org and livehealthybewell.com, two different organizations that I'm part of. I have a podcast, and we have newsletters, etc. And donating, donating to the Institute for Responsible Technology. Right now, we need to alert the world about the possibility of replacement of nature by gene-edited organisms in mass by tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions. And that's an irreversible phenomenon. And it's already, we're already behind time. So the Institute for Responsible Technology that I founded, we pioneered the behavior change messaging that changed the eating habits of so many people. I spoke in 45 countries, and we've been very effective. But now, we need to get the whole world aware that we have arrived at an inevitable time in human civilization, inevitable, where we can recode uh, the structure of the DNA, redirect the, the streams of evolution with very little money, and we don't have the balancing ethics morality, scientific understanding, or long-term vision that should accompany this ability 
So we need to implement a no-release policy. Yeah, do your GMO in a laboratory, protect it, do not release it. It could change the gene pool forever. And it's true that even injecting Roundup into pregnant mice caused the great-grandchildren to suffer more than the grandchildren who suffered more than the children because there's an epigenetic effect that gets inherited. So even the chemicals that we're releasing can have a devastating effect on future generations. But right now, we, need, we are desperate for the financial resources so we can build the staff and the materials. So if you go to protectnaturenow.com, you can watch a three-minute video. And perhaps by the time this is up, there'll be other videos because we'll have received funding. And we can do other videos about the genetically engineered bacteria, about various, about the, the RNA uh, interference technologies, about these new uh, types of GMOs. We need to build up the resources of educational materials and build a coalition around the planet so that all the different groups, from climate change to ocean saving to animal rights to gardeners to birders, all talk about protecting nature now. Protecting nature now from a widespread replacement. So that it's taught in curriculum in schools, so that it becomes part of the institutional review board policy and academic policy, so that everyone on the planet realizes we're playing with matches next to a, a fire, potential fire, that could engulf all future generations and all living beings. We have to get the word out wide around the planet, and we have to bring in religious leaders, scientific leaders, indigenous people, media, politics. Because any country, any academic institution, any transnational corporation could pump out so many dangerous GMOs, it could affect every ecosystem where they end up for all future generations. So we need help financially. So that's one thing individuals can do that would help us. And that's responsibletechnology.org. Why are you so concerned about GMOs, yet the United States governmental agencies such as the USDA and FDA don't even seem to think it's a problem? The FDA was given a mandate to promote GMOs. A friend of mine went to a lecture years ago with the, one of the top people from the FDA, and one of his PowerPoint slides says the two, the two purposes of the FDA, second one was promote biotechnology. It's their job. You know, and that's the same thing they were told, the EPA, and they told the USDA. It's basically the enforcement wing of the biotech industry. We know from the documents made public from the lawsuit, the three lawsuits that were Monsanto, now Bayer, was found guilty of causing the cancer of the plaintiffs and hiding the evidence. We know that they had their own, um, their own lapdogs in the EPA. Their person was in charge of policy at the FDA. Their lapdogs were running the EPA's evaluation of, of glyphosate in terms of its ability to cause cancer. The biotech governor of the year is the current USDA uh, secretary, and the previous one was another biotech governor of the year. It's loaded dice. It's absolutely captured organizations. And I remember speaking to one someone, someone from the FDA in a fairly high position, and I just happened to drop two pieces of information about research that I've been talking about for years. She went, huh, new information. She was totally unaware of the information that I told her. It was significant dangers of GMOs. It just blew past. What more can you tell me about GMO fish and what's wrong with them? Salmon is the current GMO fish that's been approved and is being eaten. Now, research on the health showed that it increased the reactivity of the serum that was taken from allergic people. It increased the, the appeared to increase the IGF-1, which is linked to cancer, and other hormones. But they used so few fish that nothing was statistically significant. Now remember, this is about to be, this was released into the food supply. And so you'd want them to be exhaustive in their health research. And they were designing it to avoid finding problems by using six fish in their study. And they used it a, a detection method, I think it was for IGF-1, where they couldn't even detect it in most fish. 
which means they were using the wrong detection method. But they didn't fix it. They just said, oh, yeah, it's, there's no problem. There are, these fish are engineered with growth hormone genes. And a promoter that keeps the growth hormone gene on at all times. So it has a gene from an Arctic eel, has a gene from a different type of salmon. And so the fish normally, the growth hormone shuts down for a certain period of the year. This is on all the time. So the fish keep growing and keep growing and keep growing and keep growing. So it's to get them to market quicker. Now, that's why they have higher levels of hormone. But they're also hungry because they're growing. And we found that out when the Canadian scientists made their own genetically engineered fish in a similar way and put them into tanks. And when they put them into the tanks where it was just the GMO fish or GMO fish and natural fish, salmon, no problem if there was enough food. They reduced the amount of food to frankenfish free. They started cannibalizing the competition, killing and eating the natural or genetically engineered salmon causing population crashes or total extinctions in each tank. Also, because they were hungry, the tanks were sort of fake ocean or fake natural uh, uh, habitats. The normal salmon wouldn't go into certain areas. But the frankenfish did. They were aggressive. They were hunting to kill. So if, this, if these fish get released, you can imagine these gangs of adolescent frankenfish going around and killing other fish, or maybe extinction. There was another type of fish called a madaka, Japanese fish. They genetically engineered it. Its offspring only survived 70% of the time instead of 100% of the time. But it had a mating advantage because it grew a little bigger, so it was more appealing to the female. So they took the characteristics exactly as they had genetically engineered and put it into a computer program and introduced into the computer program 60 GMO Madaka into a population of 60,000. They ran it, and they were shocked to find total extinction in 40 generations. Total extinction. So are we in favor of these rogue bands of ravenous fish aggressively killing in the oceans or extinct fish? Either way, not a good outcome. What's the status of the tipping point with GMOs? What does a tipping point mean, and how close are we? I introduced the concept of the GMO tipping point. Not the tipping point generically, but the GMO tipping point is the number of people needed who, to seek non-GMO food in order to get the food industry to switch to non-GMO. We achieved the tipping point in 2013 with the natural products industry, and it was in part aided by the Whole Foods announcement that they would require products to be either organic or non-GMO project verified by 2018 in order to avoid contains GMO label. They have since not supported that, but that was their plan, and that caused a rush, and, and basically the natural food industry lined up to become verified. It was an 18-month backlog. Starting in January, around January 1st, Cheerios, 2014, Cheerios said it's non-GMO. 10 days later, Grape Nuts said it was non-GMO. And then more and more companies started declaring non-GMO. Now, I used to talk about the tipping point of 5% of the US population shifting, because if there was a drop of just a few percentage points of market share, that should be enough to create a change, because the food companies weren't gaining any sales advantage from using GMOs. If they were losing market share to the competitor that put non-GMO on the same shelf, they could simply change the supply chain and stop bleeding their market share. But now we have 46% of Americans seeking non-GMO food. So the tipping point is underway in the United States on GMOs. Now, because Roundup is sprayed on non-GMOs, eating non-GMO bread doesn't mean you're avoiding Roundup, because wheat is sprayed with Roundup three to five days before harvest, often. Same with oats, and beans, etc. So our job has expanded to not just push people into non-GMO, but to push people into organic. So we created, Amy Hart and I created the film, Secret Ingredients, which is the number one most effective conversion tool to eat organic, because it describes what happens to people when they do go to organic. 
they get better. So the tipping point is underway in the United States, but not around the world. It already happened in Europe in 1999. It happened on April 27th when Unilever said no GMOs in Europe. The next day was Nestle's. The next week was everyone else from high profile coverage in the media. We want to bring the tipping point around the world. And we hope that our films and materials do so. And we, we would love support on getting that out. But we also need to focus on protecting nature from the replacement by gene edited organisms, which if we don't stop that soon, that could be a catastrophe. Why did the US EPA find that glyphosate did not cause cancer? The person ch in charge of the evaluation of glyphosate was Jess Rowland. He was Monsanto's lapdog. He's the one that said to his Monsanto handler, if he could stop this other agency from doing a uh, glyphosate carcinogenicity test, he should get a medal. He was described by their, the executives as someone that was very beneficial to Monsanto. He was, he was the subject of a letter. A letter came from uh, Marianne Copley, a 30-year year veteran, senior toxicologist at the EPA, who had to leave because she had cancer. She wrote him a fiery letter basically acknowledging that he was changing the outcome of reports to benefit the companies, that he was doing things just to get his bonuses, that he was incompetent to evaluate carcinogenicity, that one of his colleagues was probably taking bribes, and she, she urged him to finally do something right once in his life. But it fell on deaf ears because he was Monsanto's lapdog. So he was in charge of the committee, and what did he do? He picked the studies to evaluate that were designed and run by Monsanto, or at least paid for by Monsanto. And we know what they do. We know how they rig the research. I could talk for an hour on how Monsanto rigs research. It's absolutely pathetic. And when, you, when the International Agency for Research on Cancer did their evaluation, they did peer-reviewed published public studies. Why aren't more studies being done to convinc convincingly show the effects from eating GMO food versus non-GMO foods? Who will pay? Who will pay for those studies? More than 90% of all the research on GMOs are paid for by the biotech industry. I was told by Professor Elaine Ingham that hundreds of scientists were deterred from doing any GMO research because of what happens to those who do. And what happens to those is they get bullied, threatened, they lose funding, they lose tenure, they get forced out of their positions. We've seen it time and time again. I interview a lot of them. These are often high profile poster children that are used as examples of what would happen if you dare to do studies on GMO and find that there's a problem. And even if you want to do a study, you need to get access to the seeds. And there's patents that make it very difficult to legally access the seeds. There was a letter signed by 26 entomologists complaining that it was very difficult to do independent research on GMOs because they weren't accessing the seeds. And oftentimes, if they did get permission, it was with a contract that the biotech company could review the data and decide whether it was going to be published. You touched on some. What health issues seem the most correlated with eating GMO foods? I can tell you that the number one is digestive problems. According to our survey, digestion, this is in terms of self-reporting, fatigue, obesity, brain fog, anxiety, depression, and other mood problems, food sensitivity and allergies, and then you get into a bunch of others, pain, joint pain, skin conditions, that includes diabetes, heart disease, gluten sensitivity, menstrual problems, um, Parkinson's, cancer, all these things are related, but the main ones that I mentioned at the top. Now, that's in terms of self-reporting. But that doesn't mean that that's the most accurate way. There's certain correlations, like we talked about autism. Someone who, whose child has autism, they may never try and put that autistic child on an organic diet, or the damage may be done so that you need to do a lot more than just switch the diet in order to reverse the damage. So it's not clear based on reports 
But I am convinced that digestive disorders are extremely related to GMOs and Roundup. Do we need GMOs to make crops that can better withstand rising temperatures from climate change? Crops that are drought tolerant, heat tolerant, those require also higher yield. Those require the interaction of many genes, not just a single gene. We haven't yet cracked the code to be able to actually create effective drought tolerant, heat tolerant, higher yield crops through genetic engineering. What works far better is selective breeding. Now you can use the methodologies of genetic engineering to help selective breeding go along more quickly. You identify which genes are successful at, say, well, you know, uh, withstanding certain temperatures. When you cross all these different crops together, you can take little pieces of the offspring and find out which ones have those genes, and then you can cross those and find out which ones have those genes. So as you're developing your variety, you can speed it along if you, what's called marker-assisted selection. You're not genetically engineering the plant. You're just seeing which plants that were created from natural selection have the genes you're looking for. So it speeds up the process of creating the ones that you're looking for, of creating the traits. But one of the issues is the biodiversity. When there's so much biodiversity in the food supply, et cetera, then you'll often have farmers in drought-stricken areas, in, heat in, in hot areas, with the seeds that can do it. And you just grow out those if there's a shift. What problem we have with the current monoculture and the way that our food supply is, that we've eliminated the biodiversity from so many of these crops. Now, we have some of them preserved in seed banks. But there should be an effort to grow them out and introduce them so that we end up starting to create the biodiversity that was there 100 and 200 years ago. And then we'll have the security to do what we need to do in times of climate change, uh, drought, flood, etc. Is there reason to believe glyphosate strips minerals from the body? Why does it matter if we have less minerals? Glyphosate was originally patented to strip the minerals off of the walls of boilers and pipes, because it's a chelator. It's the most active chelator. It just grabs on all these minerals. And what it does is it makes plants mineral deficient. It makes the animals that eat the Roundup and Roundup Ready crops mineral deficient. It makes us mineral deficient. Minerals are cofactors in biochemical pathways. So to make it clear, you hire a foreman. You hire all the people. You have all the tools. You're ready to build the house. But no one does anything. They're all on strike until the mineral shows up and says, go. Without the mineral, nothing happens. All these different biochemical pathways are idle without these minerals. Mineral deficiency is linked to dozens or hundreds of diseases, depending on who you talk to. And sometimes the application of minerals in the diet that are absorbable can reverse diseases. So it actually is a huge piece of health. And I was speaking, I have a Healing from GMOs and Roundup online conference. I was speaking to Dr. Lee Cowden, who creates protocols for other doctors as his profession. And he said he's been testing minerals with patients and realizes that the American population needs more minerals now every year because of the Roundup causing the chelation or grabbing onto minerals making them unavailable. Are Roundup sprayed crops deficient in nutrients? Do the GMO fields have a lower amount of nutrients than those same crops grown in the non-GMO field? Well, certainly they have less minerals because of the mineral chelation. But uh, a friend of mine went to two different uh, fields side by side, walked in a certain number of rows, walked down a certain number of plants, picked some corn, got it tested, and the minerals in the GM corn were abysmal, sometimes 10, 40 times less. It was just ridiculous, absolutely devoid of nutrients. And it had formaldehyde, so, which is a carcinogen, yeah, among other things. Who approved GMOs in the first place? And 
Why did they approve GMOs if they were health and environmental concerns? The Bush administration was convinced that GMOs were going to help increase U.S. exports and increase and decrease a trade deficit. So the, uh, the Council of Competitiveness run by Dan Quayle uh, was trying to shore up you, you know, U.S. exports and he, de he declared it in the Indian Treaty Building in the uh, room in the White House on May of 1992 that they were going to not allow, not impose uh, regulations on GMOs that would hamper the production. And two days later, this hands-off policy created by Michael Taylor at the FDA was announced. Michael Taylor, Monsanto's former attorney, later Monsanto's vice president. So the purpose was to increase U.S. exports. The opposite happened. The purpose was to increase U.S. control of the food supply. The opposite happened. But the White House had instructed the FDA, EPA, and USDA to promote GMOs. And so that's why you ended up with GMOs in the market that should never have been there. How can people donate to your nonprofit uh, if they want to support your work? Thank you for that question. Go to responsibletechnology.org. There's a donate tab. And you can decide whether you want to do it one time, monthly, quarterly, or yearly. If you do it on a recurring basis, then we can count on the money coming through and we can budget accordingly. So we can hire someone to help get the word out to schools, etc. We can hire someone to create a global coalition to alert them. We can create a project that requires um, money expenditures over several months because we know that we're going to be getting money in the future. So if there's any way that you can do that, that would be wonderful. Does glyphosate promote leaky gut syndrome? And if so, how? If you look at a Petri dish with human cells and you put in glyphosate, before you put it in, they're all tight together. It's called tight junctions. When you add it, they separate. So yeah, leaky gut. What happens is then the undigested proteins can get through the walls of the gut. The immune system attacks it, and that can create autoimmune disease and inflammation and all sorts of problems. Bt toxin, which is used in some GMO crops, pokes holes in insects to kill them. Is there any reason to be concerned that GMOs that have Bt toxin may be dangerous to humans? I think so. What do you think? 2012 Journal of Applied Toxicology, they applied some Bt toxin to human cells, and guess what? The same holes that, the, that gets drilled into the gut walls of insects happen in human cells. Yes, also Bt toxin does evoke immune and allergic responses in humans and mice. So we think it's extremely dangerous. I believe it is probably creating leaky gut inside the cells, whereas Roundup creates leaky gut between the cells. Not a good combination. And Bt toxin was found in the blood of 93% of the pregnant women tested in Canada and 80% of their unborn fetuses. Since it's a whole poking toxin in fetuses, there's no blood-brain barrier there. It might be poking holes in the brains of these fetuses that we don't know. But it's not something we should be experimenting with. It's also toxic to red blood cells, and it's in the blood supply. How did it get in the blood supply? Possibly through the holes that it creates. Now, if 93% of the pregnant women tested have Bt toxin in their blood, why is that? It's not Mexico where they eat corn tortillas every day. It should wash out rather quickly. So the Authors of the study surmised that it was eating the meat from animals that ate Bt crops their whole lives. But there's another possible explanation. If the gene that produces the Bt crop were to transfer from corn, where it is contained, into the DNA of bacteria living in our guts, and if that gene were to continue to function, it might be producing the Bt toxin from within our own gut bacteria. And that may be why 93% of the pregnant women tested in Canada have Bt toxin in their blood. Is it possible for genes to transfer to gut bacteria? In the only human feeding study on a current GMO ever tested, they found that it did. Part of the gene that creates Roundup Ready Soy ended up integrated into human gut bacteria. They found that. We don't know if it was continuing to function. No one tested the Bt toxin. But that would be very serious if we're colonizing the gut flora of this generation with bacteria that creates an insecticide that pokes holes in guts and creates immune system reactions.
You mentioned your movie, Secret Ingredients. Can you tell us just a little bit more about what that was all about? When I produced and directed the film Genetic Roulette, so many people changed their diet. It was seen about two million times online. It was played on PBS stations over 300 times. And people would stop eating GMOs, and they would report to me by tens, hundreds, that they would feel better, that their diseases would go away, that their kids stopped acting out, they were, they were no longer to be kicked out of school, you know, really serious changes. And those reports, I was feeling a little pressure because I was getting them all, maybe more than anyone on the planet, and I wanted to share them. And it was far more convincing to have those reports over and over again to get more and more people to stop eating GMOs and to eat organic. So we went, I went to a chiropractic conference to speak, and I announced from the podium, we have a video camera here, and my partner Amy Hart, uh, we want to videotape anyone that has a story about avoiding GMOs and getting better. And Kathleen DiChiara came and said, I had, my family had 21 chronic conditions between the five of us. My son was autistic, and this and this and this. I was disabled, unable to work, started experimenting with food, became uh, a student of, of food, and did 1,700 hours of study, and then listened to 800 hours of interviews, and you know, read all these things. And I started experimenting on the family, and taking out gluten, and taking out this and all that. We got a little better, but it wasn't until we went organic that all the problems went away. I went, oh my God, this is the story we need to cover. Then in comes in Dr. Marsha Schaefer. She runs a chiropractic clinic. All these in infertile couples come. There was over 50 of them that went through a protocol. They all have kids now. Now it's 123, but at the time it was in the 50s. She became another person in our, in our film. And there was another couple we found later. Their son was autistic. Their daughter had, autism, had, had asthma. And they switched to organic, and the son is no longer on the spectrum, and the daughter no longer has asthma. All of these things, over and over again. And we had um, doctors like Dr. David Perlmutter say, this is why it happens to the gut bacteria. Doctors like pediatrician Michelle Perro, this is what I'm seeing in my clinic. And we had scientists speaking. We had animation. We put the whole thing together. And it was emotionally driven stories with scientific understanding that gave people permission to believe what was actually happening in the people. And the combination has become the most successful conversion tool to organic. What do we hear now? I saw your film, changed my diet, you saved my life. We hear that all the time. And every time I show it, I showed it today to a theater near here. And I asked the question, how many people, first question I asked before I answered any other questions after the showing, how many people have already decided to eat more organic in their life? All but two people's hands went up. I didn't ask them why I didn't put them on the spot. Maybe they were already 100%. And then I said, how many people have already thought of someone they want to share the film with? And nearly every hand went up. So it's a very powerful secret ingredients movie is where you can see it, or on iTunes or Google Play. But go to Secret Ingredients Movie, put down your name. We're going to help. We're helping people switch to organic more and more as we get tips and tricks and things that we can help, so that people's transition to organic lifestyle is less expensive, funner, and easier. Have there been tests on which foods have the most glyphosate on them? In fact, we've compiled all those tests. See, the FDA is supposed to compile it for all these different herbicides and whatnot. But for some reason, they don't do Roundup. It's like, that's the one they don't do. They don't do glyphosate residue. So independent groups have done it. We've put them all together in one report. It's available at responsibletechnology.org. Both the raw ingredients, as well as processed foods, as well as dog foods and cat foods, wine, beer, et cetera. You said that glyphosate is an endocrine disruptor what does that mean, and how does that affect our health? Well, we don't know if low-dose, tiny doses, cause the endocrine disruption. We're not sure. Low doses cause non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I mean, tiny amounts, parts per trillion. We don't know if it was an endocrine disruption or something else. But we do know that glyphosate can mess up aromatase. Aromatase determines the balance between estrogen and testosterone. So that's important. And so there's the opportunity, the possibility, that throwing off our hormones can mess up a lot of things. And it's not just hormones. It's also neurotransmitters. 
like serotonin, dopamine, and melatonin. And those are created from the precursors called aromatic amino acids. And those are produced by gut bacteria through a pathway called shikimate pathway, which is disabled by glyphosate. So do the math. When people stop, when people switch to organic, their mood issues, depression, anxiety, their pain, Parkinson's, different things get better that are linked uh, causally to these neurotransmitters. You know, sleep problems. A lot of people, they get better from sleep. They get better, they have less insomnia and other sleep disorders. Melatonin comes from the same pathways. And if there's not enough melatonin, we have a problem with sleep and other things, because melatonin is really important for the brain. So uh, these delicate mechanisms are being smashed by glyphosate. Can you sum up everything we've talked about tonight in 15 seconds? Eat organic, tell others about it, and contribute to the Institute for Responsible Technology. What's the one thing I must do today? Having heard this, I've been involved in behavior change messaging for a quarter of a century, helping people make healthier choices. And your question is excellent. What can you do today? That's actually the answer to ask the question, what can I do today? Not tomorrow, not 10 minutes or 20 minutes or hours after you hear this information, but what can you do now? For some, it's getting to what I call the cupboard stage, where they literally throw out everything that's not organic. Not everyone has the ability to do that. But people have the ability to make a commitment. For example, a commitment could be, I want to spend a month going organic, and I want to take notes. I want to know what my mood is, my energy level, and every symptom rated 1 to 10, and what percentage of organic I'm eating every day, comparing it to that. So I want to know for sure what a difference an organic diet would make. Maybe some people will commit to cooking every Sunday enough food for the rest of the week to put it in the freezer or the refrigerator, or maybe get together with their friends. Whatever it is, that's the question. What can I do today? Let's make it more narrow. What could you do now, now that you know? And it could be about yourself. It could be about getting information out. It could be about making a donation. But the key is, as you said, today, now. Why do you feel it's so important for you to come here to speak at the Real Truth About Health Conference? I enjoy the fact that you make the answers to my questions available to so many people. That's actually part of our mission. Knowledge has organizing power. It's pretty clear that when we educate people about the dangers of GMOs, they try to change their diet, and most are successful, and that changes the entire food supply. Now we have to get the word out about protecting nature from being replaced by gene-edited organisms. It's all based on education. So this is an educational platform. An advantage that I have every time I come, and I've been to every one of them, is I get to meet colleagues because they often bring all the GMO people together in the same couple of days. I know most of the people who are coming to speak, and I get enjoy the pe meeting the people that I hadn't met, and we get to share information, do live Facebooks, et cetera. So it's really fun and very valuable. Trying to protect the planet from the replacement of nature by a corrupted gene pool. I'm looking to all sources, including indigenous wisdom, indigenous leaders. I was meeting in Hawaii with someone who had worked with indigenous peoples for decades. And he told me a story. He said in 1991, he was sitting with a, a Hawaiian elder who had his eyes closed. And he said, I want you to get a group together in 1990 blank, and 1990 blank, and 1990 blank, to start preparing. But do it before 2000, because there'll be an event that'll make it very difficult to have progress. And then 2015 or 17, get your, get your group and catch the world as it falls, and stand it up in a good way. If you're successful, you'll have 2,000 years of peace. If you're not, 
It will be the end of biological evolution as we know it. When he said the end of biological evolution as we know it, I realized that that expression was the most accurate expression of replacement of nature, of eliminating the products of the billions of years of evolution and replacing it with laboratory creations that are prone to side effects. And I realized that this Hawaiian elder probably wasn't talking about something else because there's nothing else that fits that bill so perfectly as what I'm working on. So I, first of all, I didn't feel quite so alone, supported by a Hawaiian elder, indigenous people. But it also left open the other question. If we protect the world, why would we have 2,000 years of peace? Is it that there's something else coming that will give us 2,000 years of peace, but only if we can protect nature? It's still worth to protect nature, yeah. Or is even the process of protecting nature going to contribute to that? And I asked a Hawaiian elder when I was there, a different one, about the Hawaiian understanding of the exchange between humans and nature. We talked about aloha aina. Aina is the environment, but it's not just some distant thing. It's beloved. And there's an aloha aina is this reciprocity between nature and man. So I thought, well, that's interesting. If we protect nature, if we teach people to honor nature and understand that the intelligence of nature is supreme and give nature the opportunity to express herself, are we going to develop and incorporate the orderliness, the harmony that nature has? Is there going to be an aloha aina, a reciprocity, so that we can help better establish our 2,000 years of peace as a blessing from nature who we've stepped forward to protect. I don't know, but I like the story. And it's worth doing. It's worth protecting biological evolution as we know it and to hope that we end up with 2,000 years of peace. And why not love nature and honor nature and consider nature sacred as part of the teaching that we do now to protect her, all living beings, and all future generations. In fact, some may think of this as a duty that they have to bear. I think of it as an opportunity. Think about it. No previous generation could ever have protected all living beings and all future generations because previous generations did not have technologies that could destroy or damage all living beings and all future generations. So we have something to do as humans now in this generation that sets us apart from the human race that has come before. We get to be the protectors of everything. This stepping up as the human species in the right way could also propel us towards 2,000 years of peace. Let's try it.